I first got into crypto through the MIT Bitcoin Club. So kind of like similar to the Stanford Blockchain Club. Um, this was back in 2015 um, and I was mining Ethereum in my dorm room. I would go find like old graphics cards from the dumpster that labs would get rid of. And I'd set them up in like milk crates and use the free electricity um, to make a bit of extra money. Um, and it was like really weird back then. Um, but yeah, I think that I first was really intrigued by crypto and kind of the idea of decentralizing a lot of financial infrastructure because I felt that so much power was concentrated in central banks and large financial institutions and what Bitcoin and other decentralized technologies provided was basically a way to give that power back to the people. Um, and I think we've seen that happen to some extent in kind of a more globalized financial system, um, a lot of what's been popping up in DeFi. In terms of what brought me to the Vana problem space, I think one of the places where power is really concentrated today is in large, just very large companies whose market cap comes primarily from their unique access to user data. So these are companies like Facebook and Google that have really built their business model on um, knowing a lot of, having a lot of data on people and being the only ones who have that data. And so what we're doing at Vana is we're using kind of the same decentralized tools um, to allow people to own that data that they might not even think of as owning, um, use it for themselves for insights um, and monetize it by giving it access, kind of giving access to it to many different organizations. Um, so our mission is to shift the flow of data for a more prosperous world. Uh, a more capitalist framing is essentially the financialization of data. So we're adding a native incentive layer to data so that it can flow out of the places where it can kind of get stuck today. Amazing. And, you know, in terms of some of the early use cases of this, where do you see this, you know, maybe gaining the most traction? Uh, like, you know, I, I noticed on your website, you know, you talk about sort of various Fortune 500 companies, I know you talk about research institutions, perhaps medical institutions. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the... Um, a lot of examples kind of flow around even like 23andMe, for example, you know, like why, why do you like kind of let them monetize all that kind of valuable genetic data instead of you kind of getting direct access to that yourself? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's like kind of crazy the way that the data economy works today with like users, we'll compare it even to like data serfdom, right? Where everyone's just like out there generating this valuable data and then a very small number of very large companies are taking that data and um, basically owning all of that value that's created. I think too, something to mention is that it's not necessarily that they set out to do a really bad thing where they were like, I want to build an evil business with data. But I think that kind of the exponentials that come from data where you take data, you learn patterns from it. Um, those patterns are essentially machine learning models that you can use to better make predictions, better your product. And that ends up just being very exponential in nature. In terms of our early use cases, um, I want to start by first talking about like the idea of data ownership is not new. I think a lot of people ideologically agree with like people should own their data. There have been projects that try to um, allow people to um, take back this ownership. I think one of the problems is that often the format of the data is not that usable. So if you think about um, TikTok data, for example, the whole product is really engineered around collecting a valuable training data set, right? So you have people like scrolling on TikTok and then you can only watch one video at a time. So TikTok knows if you like the video, if you engage with it or not, right? And so because of that, they have um, all this information on um, how you scrolled, what videos you watch, and they're able to predict what's going to make you the most engaged. Um, the problem is if you want to have another company use that data set, they're not trying to predict what sort of content will be most engaging to you. They're trying to predict something else, right? So often the missing piece is that you don't have um, the like output labeled data set if you try to transfer the data into a different use case. Um, and so that ends up being, um, kind of the result is that the data is not that valuable if it's not labeled. So if you look at um, just individually someone's Spotify data, all the music they've listened to and their preferences, that's worth about 30 cents. 
Um, and it's kind of inconvenient for a user to go connect that data source, export it, et cetera. And it might not be worth it to them if that's all that they're going to earn. Um, what we really focused on at Vana is building tools to allow people to augment the value of their data. So going back to the Spotify example, if you both have your Spotify data and then you also label it with your fashion preferences. So what we have is essentially a Tinder style swiping of I like this sweater, I don't like that sweater. Um, we're able to partner with um, a Fortune 500 company that pays users $25 a data point for this data, right? So it's really a hundred times more valuable when the data is labeled. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, where we've found a good starting point because it really incentivizes users to, to get their data connected. Interesting. So is that pretty common among the kind of like the data universe, essentially, when you aggregate data across a specific user, it has sort of that exponential value increase? Um, you know, yeah, you when, yeah, essentially when you label it and you see it too, like, um, I think scale AI is a good example of like how valuable data labeling is, right, where at the end of the day, like you need labeled data for it to be extremely valuable and companies realize that like data on its own, if not labeled, does not really work. In the case of scale, they're focused more on areas where um, kind of anybody can label the data. So they can have many people around the world label, um, is this a stop sign or is this not a stop sign? Whereas for Vana, we're having people label things like, um, how do you feel about this piece of clothing to predict cultural trends? And that you need a particular person to do. Amazing. And so how does this look like as a product, uh, you know, what, or, you know, in the next six months, year or so, you know, what, what does an early version of this look like for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the early version essentially looks like you connect your data. Um, and so today it can be a little bit arduous to connect your data. The companies that have built their market caps on unique access to data don't want to make it easy for you to make your data very portable. Um, but because of recent regulation um, like CCPA, GDPR, et cetera, users do have the legal right to that data. And so essentially exercising your legal right to export your data, that's sometimes in the form of um, requesting it. We'll walk you through the steps on how to do that. Other times you're able to connect it via API, which is nice because then you can um, always have an up-to-date version of your data where and we'll call it kind of staking your data where you're lending your data out over time to train models um, and then there's the process of labeling your data um, for what a given data scientist needs so whether that is health applications of like how do you feel today um, how do you feel energized today or whether it is more forecasting predictions like um consumer sentiment of like, you, would you make a big purchase in the next three months? Um, that's essentially the process of you labeling and increasing the value of your data. Um, and that's all around monetization. And I think that we see that as a really important first step in building the Vana ecosystem. But there are other really important aspects like portability, right? So just being able to log in with MetaMask and then having all of your data there with you, right? Um, or other aspects of kind of being able to even like train machine learning models for yourself. I personally train models on my like sleep data just because I think it's very interesting. And I think like giving access to other data scientists, more individual data scientists to do this as well, where I think a lot of my um, kind of really smart machine learning and data science friends, they kind of have to go work at Facebook or Google because they're who have all of the data. Um, but I think we envision a world where the data can flow more freely and people from smaller organizations, research institutions, et cetera, can have access to that as well. Amazing. So I'm kind of envisaging this world where, you know, Vana sort of sits at the middle. I go to Vana, I plug in all these sort of disparate data sources. Maybe it's Spotify, maybe it's 23andMe, maybe it's my credit card statements and, and stuff like that. And then on the kind of the other side, I can start to pick, okay, Spotify wants to pay me this amount to have access to this amount of data for this amount of time. Um, and like, and so on and so forth, right? With this kind of universe of companies. What, um, so it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on, so how does, how does blockchain kind of enable this? Um, you know, would we be able to do this in a kind of a centralized world? Um, and and if, if not, what, like, why can we do this better in a blockchain kind of world? Yeah, um, I really like that question and exactly what you described, right? So basically you're connecting your data sources and then 
you are permissioning your data with your private keys, right? So we call it a non-custodial data wallet. So we um, kind of in the full decentralized version of the product, which we're working towards, we never see your data. You can basically set up a smart contract that says, okay, if this kind of organization wants to access my data for $10, I'll let them. Or if this person has said that this use case works well, then I'll allow, I'll kind of grant access to my data or I'll even donate my data for, um, climate change related use cases. Um, so that's sort of uh, the way that we see users permissioning data with their private keys. Um, I think the question of like, why blockchain, why use crypto is so important to ask. And I think people sometimes forget to ask that question in Web3. Um, I think for us, it's sort of twofold. So one is um, a, a sort of incentives problem. And then two is more of like a, a regulatory problem. So I'll start with the incentives problem. Basically, uh, if you just have one data point, it's not really worth anything. It's worth something when you have 10,000 data points because then you can train a model on it, right? And so really allowing people to come together and capture the value of what their data is worth altogether is a very natural kind of token incentives problem. And what's interesting as well is when you think about the value of a data point, um, something that's kind of counterintuitive is today, a lot of machine learning models are missing data on underrepresented groups. So people of color or people of different sort of um, sexualities, et cetera. And um, so, uh, sometimes it's framed in a weird way where kind of companies go and they're like, we really want your data for this. And it's not, um, it doesn't feel welcoming, right? But in a world where you can actually um, just make money off of that, right? Where it's like, hey, our community can come together. We're usually underrepresented, but in this case, our data is actually worth more because of that. It's really like this beautiful um, kind of redistribution that comes from data. And so all of that comes out of um, an ecosystem of tokens that represent the value of these different data sets. Um, and so I think that essentially decentralization provides really strong tools for like token based incentives. Um, and that's like the first reason I would cite. I will say that we can get started without it and we have gotten started without it. So we allow people to earn um, a stable coin or even an Amazon gift card. I think so often a company will um, prevent themselves from iterating and coming to market because they want to start fully decentralized. I think in our case, like we're able, we don't have to go through the whole process of like creating a token, et cetera, in order to understand, hey, do people want to sell their data? How do they want to sell their data? What features do they need? Um, but long term, I think that token incentives are a really strong um, way for, for Vana to most empower its users to capture the value that their data creates. Um, I can give another really specific example. So if you imagine um, all Tesla drivers in the Bay Area are basically collecting data for Tesla, right? Um, and Tesla at some point is going to build a very valuable self-driving car model from all of this data. Uh, but there's not enough data yet, right? And so essentially what you can do is you can have all Tesla drivers pool together the data that their Tesla creates. Um, and initially it's not valuable, but instead they can get kind of this Tesla self-driving model token that the community creates. And then as there is whatever the threshold is, whether it's a few million um, different rides, et cetera, um, once you're able to have the data set such that maybe crews can buy some of that data and train a machine learning model on that data set, um, then users are able to capture that value that their data created, right? And so that kind of, um, we call it predictive value of somebody's data, where it becomes valuable when you pull a lot of it in, um, is why token incentives are a really great tool for us. Um, so that's on the incentives piece. Um, another reason why uh, blockchain and kind of the tools of decentralization are really important to us are more from a regulatory perspective. So um, if we try to do build Vana in a fully centralized way, so for example, we allowed, we went to Facebook on behalf of users and we said, give us this user's data. We actually don't legally have the right to do that. Only the individual user has the right to request their data. So by building it in a decentralized way where every individual user 
is requesting their own data, we're really able to use a lot of very powerful data regulation to let people access their data. Um, there have been examples, there's a company called Do Not Pay that lets people, they were having, making it really easy for folks to delete their Facebook accounts and Facebook actually blocked their domain entirely. Um, and so you can't even, you can't post their domain, you can't send it in a Facebook message or anything, right? And what you see is these really, like these companies will just block anybody who's doing this. And so by doing it in a decentralized way, there's no central point to block, right? We're just empowering yeah. every individual user to go get their data and um, do what they see fit with it. That, that's really fascinating on the, on the regulatory side. And coming back to the kind of the incentive side and, and the token side, how much of this is, is a pressing problem for you right now? Because I think a lot of a lot of startups, particularly in the crypto space, kind of rush into you know wanting to launch a token and maybe don't fully think through the supply dynamics and you know what the what the token could essentially look like, you know, once it's inflationary and you know the liquidity provisioning and everything of that. How how does how do the token economics work for this? Um, or yeah. how are you sort of starting to think about some of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and maybe something to add as well on my background. So um I got, first got started at the MIT Bitcoin Club. Um, I ended up dropping out of school to start a machine learning company that came out of the World Bank. Um, and then I joined Celo, which is a mobile first cryptocurrency that came out of MIT um, as the third engineer. And over there, I was really focused on making um, the blockchain and light client kind of accessible to those who most need um, financial infrastructure. Um, and Celo is a sort of reserve backed, stable coin. And so that sort of like token economics is very top of mind. Um, in the case of Vana, I think one, I will say like, we don't need to figure this out for a while. And that's why we're delaying bringing something to um, full decentralized token market. Uh, and I think a lot of companies I would actually recommend that they wait longer because you need to figure out the dynamics and incentives among your users. And you can test that in a reasonably centralized way before you bring it to market. Um, but I'm happy to share what our current iteration of the token model is, which is essentially for people to be able to create machine learning model specific tokens. So that Tesla model that I gave as an example. Um, and then whenever somebody calls the machine learning model, so they want to use it to make a prediction. So it's like a model API. If you go to like Google Cloud or AWS, or you, you can look at like GPT-3, essentially what it's providing is um, inference as a service. So you send it a data point and then it, it like runs the model and gives you the output. And so essentially the way that it works in the Vana system is in order to call a machine learning model, you have to burn the model specific token whenever you want to call the API, right? And so what that is doing is essentially allowing all the users um, and holders of the token to, um, both govern who gets access to the machine learning API and also hold this token that is uh, decreasing in supply as the machine learning model gets used more and more. That's that's really interesting. It's kind of like, um, it's almost a bit like numerized model, but you know, hyper like sort of, it's like fragmented and specific on, you know, training each specific model. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. Like um, just downstairs, Albert from our team, um, who was really involved in architecting the Numerai system um, is like thinking about similar problems. So yeah, I think that Numerai has like a really interesting approach that, that we admire a lot. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I'd love to open this up to the audience. You know, we, we could go on for ages and, you know, Anna and I will keep chatting, but if anyone has, you know, any questions or wants to chime in, feel free to just raise your hand, come off mute. I know, I think Josh had a question earlier. Yeah, thank, thanks for being with us, Anna. Um, one thing, I'd love to think about, you talked about how this can sort of attract like underrepresented groups, which is great, but um, how do you think about controlling for something like, well, we're naturally going to attract a young tech savvy demographic and does that sort of feed the model with what it is like, may maybe not uh, diversity on sort of some of the traditional characteristics we think about, but the user population that might be using them. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's something that's really top of mind for our customers and data buyers because they really want a representative group of people. Um, and so we've had to, so from the young perspective, um, the companies that we sell to today are primarily targeting a young demographic. So 18 to 35 is sort of the sweet spot of like 
we're going to be really good at helping you make predictions about that demographic. We're not going to be very good at helping you make predictions for people who are 70 to 80 years old. Um, and so that's part of it, just sort of setting expectations of this is the demographic that we have today. Um, and then there's also an aspect of uh, really proactively sourcing specific people um, to share their data. Um, so someone on our sourcing team used to source people for like healthcare trials and essentially find these niche demographics that are often underrepresented. And so we also use that to basically rebalance the sample. Well, that's, that's super interesting. Um, and then one other question I had, um, you've taught, I think the ML sort of research use case is super fascinating and there's some commercial use cases. Do you think that um, this user, like, do you foresee a scenario in which users submit their data and say, yes, like, I want to be paid for this to go to advertisers? And is that someone that there's, there's obviously a huge willingness to pay bucket of dollars from advertisers. Is that something you've thought either philosophically about or from a business model standpoint? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that so often when people hear about personal data, they immediately think the best way to monetize this is through advertising. Um, none of our customers today use it for advertising, um, and that's not currently on our product roadmap. I think that um, it's sort of like this weird optimization that so many companies fall into when they're like advertising based, where they want to maximize like eyeball to screen time and engagement time. Whereas for us, what we're really optimizing for is the value that we deliver to the users, so the amount that they're able to get paid for their data. No, it's a super cool mission and, and what you guys are working on. So I appreciate that. I think uh, Marsha has a question too, so hand it over. Hi, Anna. Thanks for doing this. Um, great company, super awesome idea. Um, I just have two questions. One is um, when there's so much data, so many kinds of data and so many kinds of people, how do you focus? Because it's a two-sided marketplace uh, in the sense that uh, you have to kind of focus on the kind of people that give the data and kind of people that want the data. And then how do you kind of think about that uh, focus and how do you think about expansion? And the second question is, uh, do you have your own token or like uh, when you say that each model has its token, uh, I didn't totally understand how the model works. Um, and could you talk about how, if you have your own token or like how the token model works in a little bit more detail? Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for the first question, um, which is essentially around, um, it's like a marketplace problem, right? Where you're like matching the people um, who own their data and want to sell their data with the people who want to buy their data. And I think this is a really common problem in marketplaces. So you see companies like Uber and Lyft who went like city to city, um, or you see other companies like Airbnb that also launched in different cities, started with a particular demographic. Um, so for us, um, related to Josh's questions, we started with um, businesses who want to work primarily with young people who live in cities. And so we have targeted primarily young people who live in cities. Um, we are expanding um, our kind of geographic region as well. And so we've done that basically in partnership with customers. So we're essentially like, okay, if you want for us to expand to this new market, there's some critical mass of users that will partner with you to bring on board. Um, and so I guess the answer to that question is really like, it's a partnership question with a lot of our customers and balancing that with the users that we onboard. Um, to your second question, um, Vana does not have a token. I think that creating a token can actually be very distracting for a company in the Web3 space. And the best thing for us to advance our mission is really to empower our users to take their data and monetize it and, and shift this flow of data for a more prosperous world. Um, and today that does not involve a direct token. Manu? Hi, Anna. Hey, this is a phenomenal idea and wish you all the best. And I had a couple of questions on this. So first of all, like, uh, do you have any competitors in the space? Like, because you're the, um, this is the first company I'm hearing about, which is trying to uh, take on the Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, it's a very ambitious goal. And so I think some people will sort of set out to do um, different parts of it. Um, in terms of competitors, the one that comes to mind is Ocean Protocol. Um, and so they are kind of a decentralized system for people to um, build different data marketplaces. Um, but really what Ocean is designed around is for people to sell data that they traditionally think of as owning, right? So businesses to sell their own data. 
Whereas we've really architected Bana around empowering people to sell data that they don't think of as themselves owning. Um, there are other companies like, um, trying to think. So yeah, essentially there are companies in the space that basically allow you to answer surveys and monetize your data. You're typically making um, maybe like a few dollars a month. You're not able to make very much for it. And that's usually because companies are selling um, aggregated insights on their data sets versus empowering data scientists to train really specific models. Um, but it's a space that I think um, has a lot of potential. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd say um, it's it's relatively new. Um, I gave a talk that I can send a link out to with um, Casey Caruso, who's an investor over at Paradigm. Uh, and we were talking about the kind of data fi space for like financialization of data, but it's very new. A lot of people have heard of DeFi, not a lot of people have heard of data fi. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. And so the second question is like, what if Facebook or Google says tomorrow, hey, I'm going to start paying my users some amount of uh, money uh, from their ad revenues or whatever, right? So they have this entire ecosystem built up. And let's say if Google monetizes my data to an order of probably, I don't know, like just I'm just making up some like thousand dollars a month, yeah. they can start cutting down into their profits and just start giving me probably uh, $200 a month for that or something. So do you think, uh, how will you compete with that? Because they already have an infrastructure built in and everything. And they, from for them, it's just a, mar a matter of giving a percentage of the profits right at this point. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so essentially, what Facebook is really well positioned to do is monetize just Facebook's data. And what Google is really well positioned to do is monetize just Google's data. What we've found is that what makes data extremely valuable is to have data from many different sources. So to have the same users, Facebook data and Google data and Instagram data and other labeled data. And so because of that, it would be somewhat of a strange model for Facebook to go like buy Google data in addition to a user's data and then package it up in this way. Um, I wouldn't expect that to happen. It would be very interesting if it did. Um, but I guess my answer to your question is that um, it would be great if businesses do that. I, I think they should do that. And I like absolutely encourage them to do that. Um, on top of that, I think that there's so much value, like new value to be created from combining data sources from many different services. And so that's really where we see Fauna. Got it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That's a good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Jim, um, I think you're trying to raise your hand, right? Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Anna. This is awesome. Um, just a quick question. I, I understand all the technical parts uh, quite well. Um, but wanted to ask you about um, the, the predictive value aspect and as it relates to a, a potential, you know, um, I think use the terminology, a data buyer, right? Um, I'll just give an example. Banks have a lot of data. Uh, just pick on BNY Mellon, for example. So um, <laughs> um, is, is that like a, a target or for you folks as to, to get banking data? You mentioned all those things like Google, Facebook, Instagram with the social data to do predictive yeah. analytics on that. Banking's huge, the healthcare stuff you mentioned, and Jeremy yeah. alluded to this as well. It's like um, you, um, your, your credit card transactions, for example, that's, that yeah. can give you a lot of predictive uh, vectors. So that's one thing, that's a big question. And then just a minor secondary thing that's not related to that is this. Um, I'll use the term data broker. Mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into your whole space of who your customers are? And we all know what data brokers are. It's kind of a, a, a nasty word, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 just just generally, maybe you might speak to that. And also, how do you make money? How does oh, the yeah. company make money? What's the revenue model? Is it is it via the, the token? Yeah. So that that part I haven't gotten yet. So I'll go off. Yeah, a lot of stuff there. So cheers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So for the first question, which is related to financial transaction data, um, absolutely, that's a valuable data source um, to allow our users to integrate um, and to do what they'd like to with it. I think that data set, if you imagine having like all your financial transaction data and then all the music you've listened to and all your location data, you could train really interesting models of like, hey, like you tend to spend more money when you are in this kind of mood of listening to this music and in a certain place. So I think there are really cool um, data sets that come from that. 
Um, one thing sometimes that people will notice is it's like, wow, that's like so many different data sources. How are you going to keep that structured? Or you're just throwing all this data out there. So the way that we have architected the system is that um, all data is connected to a user and we're always making predictions about individuals, right? So you're always able to look at data in that way. And that allows us to have a consistent structure across um, all these different data sources. So the second question, which was about data brokers, um, John Oliver has a really good um, segment on data brokers, if nobody has seen it, um, but it's about like the industry and it's frankly like a really dirty industry. So basically what data brokers do is they sell other people's data and that's like you like think you put your phone number and information one place and then it gets sold like a million times um, by people who are not you. And so for us, um, we uh, don't work with data brokers. Um, so we are kind of direct peer to peer data transactions, right? So we're empowering our users to directly sell their data to a data scientist. And that data scientist is not allowed um, and is not able to use that data and, and resell it in any way. Um, and so that's sort of the data brokers question. I think actually, if you look at the space, um, you know, like the early days of Bitcoin, um, and if you look at, at Coinbase as well, it was like a really scammy space and people just associated it with like being dirty and being bad. And I think Coinbase really emerged as, the, as this kind of trustworthy player um, of this legitimate place to go. And so I see ourselves as playing a similar role, right? Where today the data broker market is just like really like people are it's like people are uneasy when they think about it. And so many people's privacy is is like violated, et cetera. Agreed. And so yeah, I really agreed. see ourselves as like being that trusted partner similar to, to Coinbase, um, but in the data space. Um, in terms of the business model, that's a really good question. So today, um, in uh, the capitalist world that we exist in, it's most easy to make a system scale if there's a way for people to make money off of it. Um, and so naturally, uh, the way for uh, us to achieve our mission, which is to shift the flow of data for a more prosperous world, is for there to be a way for us to make uh, significant revenue, right? And empower our users to kind of onboard more folks. Um, and so I think a traditional model that you see in a lot of uh, companies in the Web3 space is uh, having people have to kind of burn a native platform token, right? So like Ethereum transaction fees. And so we see ourselves as, as taking a similar approach. So it's a fee-based approach, just like Ethereum. Patrick, do you wanna come off mute? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Anna, for, for joining us. Um, I have a question related to, I guess, the business model and other potential approaches that you could do with similar data. So, I mean, I'm curious if you've thought at all about identity and what you can use the same data for in an identity perspective. And this, I guess, rather than just monetizing data, it's more about using data to make your life easier. Whether that's like knowing that you're a size 10 and a half shoe size when you go into a shop in the metaverse or something like, have you, have you thought about that version of using people's data? Yes, and I love that. And that is really like what I see as the long term value add and vision for Vana. I see monetization as a path to get many people into the ecosystem. Because um, I think like ideologically, people are like, yes, let's make data portable. And then like no one ever solves the chicken and egg problem of like you have to go through this big hassle of actually connecting your data. Um, but absolutely, um, allowing people to bring their data between different services, whether that allows them to quickly create an account, verify their identity, or just kind of bring their data from old Spotify to new Spotify to validate their identity to different DeFi applications um, if there's some kind of uh, system needed for that as well. Awesome, thank you. Byron. Hey Anna, thanks so much for joining us. Super excited about this idea I've been smiling this entire talk because I think it's a very necessary necessary platform that needs to be developed in Web3. I have two questions. The first one is, do you have any mechanisms in place that are specifically targeted for data quality? It seems like survey data would be much noisier than the native labels that are available here. From the examples that you gave, like Facebook marketplace data is so valuable because people actually put dollars to it. Tesla data is valuable because people actually drive the questions. 
But in here, you're adding an auxiliary label to a not, an, an auxiliary non-native label to someone's data instance. Is there any way to ensure that if I, if I just swipe randomly on the survey just to get the dollars in, I get less compensation, I get my token isn't worth as much. Is there something there for it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I have a short-term answer and a long-term answer. So short-term, what we do today is we have a lot of methods in place to check that someone's actually paying attention. So we'll sort of like have an image where it's like, please swipe left on this. And then if they actually swipe right, um, their data is kind of disqualified. Um, we also have other things in place to detect fraud or people taking the survey multiple times. So we're closely tracking um, IP if people are coming from the same IP. And then we can also validate uh, based on someone's social account what they've connected. Um, and so that's kind of what we have in place for short term uh, fraud detection or someone's not paying attention detection. Um, and then we'll also ask the same question in multiple ways. So we'll ask someone how old they are, and then later we'll ask them what year they were born. And if someone's not really paying attention, they might sort of get that differently. So a whole bunch of little tools in place like that. It's constantly like a cat and mouse game with folks who are kind of going about fraud. So as soon as we have a new check-in, we see things come in other ways. Um, but we have a couple of people on the team who are pretty much full-time focus on this like fraud quality because it's so important. Um, and I will add to the reason why it's so important is that if you have that noisy data or that lower quality data um, from, if you have a 10,000 people and 5,000 people have given like low quality noisy data, but you can't differentiate between them, then effectively everybody's data is now worth half as much, right? Or whatever, you basically diluted the pool of data. And so in a way, those users are taking from the other users who are providing their very authentic and real data. And so it's a really important problem to us because of that. Um, in terms of the long-term solution, and you kind of hinted at this with a token, um, it's really oriented, like kind of, you can have tools of um, reputation and allowing people to pull together their data that they then put in, um, that they then contribute to a model. And if you find that somebody has not been acting um, or that their data is not clean or not good, that decreases the value of that pool of data. And so you kind of have it naturally built into a token. I think often people like have this idea of like, oh, like the token incentives will solve it. And I don't think we should count on that short term. I think that long term, it's a really useful tool for us to be able to use. But I think we'll need um, many different things in place to ensure really high data quality, because at the end of the day, that's what a data scientist cares the most about. Thanks so much for that. Really creative solutions on the short term. And <laughs> Definitely agree on the, the way you're talking about for long term. If I can squeeze in another question here, yeah. how are how have you seen how have your users been reacting to your onboarding workflow? You talked as an as a response to Patrick's question that monetization is really important for people to finally join the ecosystem that would go through the hassle otherwise. What have you what you have, you have any insights that have come out of getting people that are not usually into Web3, setting up their walls for the first time, setting up so-and-so, and what have you done in reaction to it? Yeah, that's a great question. And my like totally honest answer is that it's brutal to onboard someone into Web3 and like teach them how to use MetaMask and like write down a backup phrase or use Valora or whatever crypto wallet we want them to use. Um, I think also for users who are coming outside of crypto, they really associate crypto with like a scam. And so when they're seeing sort of like, okay, they both want my personal data and they want me to do all this weird cryptocurrency stuff, they honestly get like pretty scared. And so what we found for our early user base is that abstracting as much away as possible and even that requiring us making it custodial in the short term is needed in order to build trust with a really broad user base. Um, yeah. Very cool. Thanks so much again. Yeah, thanks for the questions. I also think we had a, we had a question in the chat relating to <clears throat> essentially the privacy aspect and the security aspect. So I think the question is twofold. Like one, um, how, you know, what ensures that you know, someone's data is is seen by the person that you sold it to, essentially. Um, and then, I guess number two, yeah, like how do, how does that kind of whole like piping infrastructure work? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll answer the second one first because I think it makes it more clear. So, the way that 
um, we've architected the system is um, actually we're not storing any data on chain. We're storing API keys for people to permission their data. So we see it as basically flows of data come in and um, the data scientist um, interface is like a GraphQL query where they can query different data sets. And so they're getting this real time fresh data that's just permissioned with people's API keys. And then somebody can say, I'm gonna grant access to my Instagram and my Aura Ring data to this company over this period of time. Um, and often that time series data is, is really valuable to train a model. Um, to the privacy question, which is like, there's so many fun technical questions there. So really privacy is important. So we have a difference between selling your data and renting your data. So today we support people selling um, their de-identified data. Long-term, what we're working on is a way for people to rent their data. And so that's in a fully privacy preserving way where no data scientist ever even sees somebody somebody's data. They're just able to learn um, patterns across that data. So there are many different approaches and frankly, it's pretty early for some of this. So one ideal state is using fully homomorphic encryption. So FHE, essentially what that is, is allowing people to train machine learning models on fully encrypted data. Um, there's a leading cryptographer in the space, Kathy Yeun, who was one of the first people to implement uh, zero knowledge proof in production. And when she first started working on zero knowledge proofs, it was kind of research phase and, and she moved it much more towards production. And she kind of describes the space of um, FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, as in a similar state today. We see ourselves as being really well positioned to use that technology when it becomes production ready. Um, other alternatives in the meantime are essentially having a trusted environment where models are trained um, and nobody's able to access the data within that environment. So then you're just having the output of a trained model. There's also a federated approach, which is similar to what like Apple uses for um, learning about your sort of what sorts of things you text and Google Photos uses to categorize things. Um, and so that's essentially training local models um that uh, go across people's devices um but it's really in the early days of this and if you are um, interested in privacy i would love your ideas as well now that's really cool and i think this is probably a good a good moment actually just to chat a bit more about the team you've assembled for this you know you mentioned you're just even like you even sort of being at the forefront and like sort of being familiar with these researchers who are you know leaders in the space and you know creating things like fully homomorphic encryption and everything and I know like even just based on the kind of the team roster on the Vana website, it's it's a bunch of like, it's a stack team from, you know, crypto native folks, people from Numeri, for example, MIT. So like, maybe just talk a bit about the team you've assembled to tackle this problem and you, you why you guys are the best at this. Definitely. Yeah. So um, my co-founder, Arthur, who goes by Art, um, was in grad school at Harvard. Um, he comes from a legal background when I was an undergrad at MIT, and that's when we first met. Um, he, yeah, is a former lawyer, uh, and then he was over at... Appin, which is a large public data collection company um, where he was selling data to some of the largest companies like Facebook. Um, and so he's kind of got the both like client data sales side of things and also um, regulatory legal side of things. Um, and then so Dan, um, another kind of engineering leader on our team is he was previously the CTO and co-founder of Labelbox, which is a billion dollar data labeling company. Um, and yeah, I think understanding like how to augment the value of data by adding labels to it is, is so important. Um, about half of our team is out of MIT, which is where we originally got started. I think we are 14 people full-time um, and maybe 15, actually we have three people starting full-time this week. So I guess we're 17 now. Um, but yeah, we just brought on actually um, Lauren Barrett as our head of product. She was previously leading product at Premise Data and at Capital One. Um, and then we also have Joe Gillespie, who's starting on Wednesday as our head of people. And he was previously the first technical recruiter at Robinhood, um, scaled their team from 40 to 1,000 engineers and was leading technical recruiting over there. Um, so I think that what really aligns our team is that we're all very um, motivated by the mission to shift the flow of data for a more prosperous world. And I think that's really allowed um, such great people to to come together around it. Incredible. Harsha, do you want to come off mute? Yes, uh, thank you so much for all the knowledge. Um, I, I think 
the part that I'm still kind of, uh, sorry for asking this dumb question, but I still don't understand is uh, the flow of uh, how I give my data and how I make money. And then uh, just like the token, like where you use the blockchain exactly and where do the tokens come into place? And if like all the tokens are being burned, then what if someone else wants to API it after? Like uh, just, uh, I'm totally lost on how the uh, flow of the, tokens or the the money works and uh and um yeah that's basically it. I, i'm not sure how it works yeah so i can answer the very specific token question to start so what you were saying is what if um somebody else wants to use the model but all the tokens have been burned so the approach that a lot of protocols will use is rather than having a fixed number of tokens that have to be burned for every for us api call for other services like some other access. Um, basically, you have to burn a certain supply of the total, a, a certain percent of the total supply, right? So you have to burn half a percent of all the tokens in supply. And so then you don't run out of these like model specific tokens. Um, but I would say there are also like a lot of details and a lot of open questions to be worked out in that token model. And that's one of the reasons as well, where it's not really our core focus right now to build that token model. We think that we can go to market without, um, needing to kind of bring that piece in quite yet. Um, and so I guess that is, that's like the high level answer of like, I mean, it, it makes sense that you're confused by the token model because like we as a team don't have the token model ironed out right now. So yeah, we're, we're on the same page there. Uh, gotcha. Uh, so how do you do it in a centralized way right now? Is it just that you take money from the uh, companies and then you give it to the users? Exactly. Yeah, we take money from the companies and then we pay the users in Amazon gift cards and stable coins. Got it. Uh, I've seen on your website that there's more than 15,000 people who signed up for the waitlist. Yeah. Is that congratulations on that? And is that the uh, number of people that you've worked with so far? Or uh, like right now, um, have you already worked with people or are these the, are these the people that you work with or uh, how much progress have you made so far? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've had about 10,000 people sell their data through Vana today. And our focus right now is not really on growing that as quickly as possible. It's really understanding from those people what they want out of an experience and how we can kind of build product to most empower them to be able to pull their data together um, and then monetize it. Uh, so yeah, and then we're kind of so we're constantly if you're on the wait list, you'll probably get emails from us asking you to try things out um, and do user interviews. And so that's really, um, you know, yeah, sort of where the, the user base is today and um, about how many people are using the product today. Awesome. So to my understanding, is it fair to say that right now, Wana is a centralized company uh, and in the future, it would be like a uh, company that uses blockchain or crypto? Or like, if it if I'm wrong, where do you use blockchain or crypto right now? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that that's true. Um, Chris Dixon has like a really good quote, which is that there's no such thing as a decentralized company. There's only such a thing as a decentralizing company. I think that all companies that long-term want to be decentralized generally start out to some extent centralized. Um, we do have kind of a lot of the technology to allow us to be decentralized in the work. So we have the ability for people to exchange an API key on chain. Um, but in terms of what's in production with our users today, um, it's fully centralized. And we've found that a lot of users at the end of the day, if it's going to be a worse product experience for them to use a fully decentralized product, they would rather use something centralized. And we don't want to kind of hold back our users by forcing them to go through hoops um, in order to, to enforce the full de decentralization, especially this early on in Web3, right? Where actually very few people are used to logging into a website with MetaMask. Yeah, I can actually see this um, kind of progressive decentralization you know, working particularly well in this instance as parts of Yovana essentially start to look like a public good, right? You know, once you build out this, build out this layer. Um, quick question on the kind of uh, how you're like thinking of signing transactions, etc. You, you mentioned like MetaMask and I know your kind of background with Celo. Are, are you thinking of doing this kind of more within the Ethereum ecosystem, which potentially has more users and more people who already have been onboarded to kind of Web3? Or are you going to go kind of at Celo, which might actually be a more kind of performant blockchain for the purposes of this? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think performance is really important for us, where if you're selling your data over periods of time and getting a daily payment, um, we can't be paying huge Ethereum transaction fees. That really kind of restricts what we're able to provide for users. Um, and so because of that, so far, we've been building on Celo. Cool. Makes sense. I'll jump in with one, one more quick one here at the end. Um, how do you think about Web3 native data in terms of folks that are interact? And this may be, you know, play this forward when people have more frequent and more meaningful interactions with Web3, things I've transacted with, and it's keys I own. Um, is that, how, how do you see that data set, which sounds like it's primarily focused currently on more of, this, you know, either real world or Web2 data, then incorporating some of the Web3 data, maybe even in ways that aren't tied to a real world identity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of our path to um, kind of like more Web3 native users, the first thing I see is like Web3 native platforms wanting Web2 data as people migrate from like a centralized to decentralized world. Um, and then much longer term, which is what you're asking about from the perspective of um, allowing people to connect Web3 native data, that kind of naturally fits within the Vana ecosystem. So that's just another data source that people are able to connect and bring around easily with them. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I was able to previously ask that, uh, so in the future, where do you see the role of uh, blockchain or crypto? Uh, I, I understand that progressively you'll be uh, using more and more of those, but in your vision, uh, what, what role do they play in the like in the workflow of Lana? Yeah, uh, so it's twofold. And I think maybe if you arrived late, part of the question had been asked already, um, but I'm happy to mention some of it again. So um, first is kind of crypto incentives. So allowing people to access the predictive value of their data. So when you have just one data point, it's not worth very much, but when you have a pool of many data points, it becomes much worth much more. And so that's really where the token incentives come in. Um, then there's the decentralized aspect. Um, so because, um, Long term, the system needs to be non custodial. Um, users are the ones directly exporting their data and permissioning it themselves. And so that's sort of the, the decentralized aspect. So there's both the token aspect and the decentralized aspect. Gotcha. So, how does the token incentive make sense with the uh, one point versus 10,000 points? Uh, yeah. example that you mentioned. Yeah. I didn't yeah. catch that. It would be great if you can explain it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, if you're a data scientist training a model and you have a single data point to learn a pattern from, you don't learn very much because you're just like looking at one data point. And if you want to understand how do people's music preferences affect their fashion preferences, you would basically be like, okay, Anna listens to this kind of music and she likes these kind of clothes. And that doesn't tell you anything that allows you to generalize to the broader population. Um, and so as you start to have more data points, you're able to learn more um, the patterns across many different people. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that um, I, I find the data scientists on Stanford's campus and ask them the same question. They might have a better answer as well. Oh, no, no, no. I get that, that <laughs> you need lots of data to uh, make it valuable. But the question I had was, uh, where does the token fit in? Where, yeah. uh, in, in the sense that you mentioned that the token uh, helps people kind of tap into that value. And how, how does the token relate to multiple people uh, giving that data? Yeah, that's a great question. I do have to go for, I have to go yeah. in like one minute. Um, but essentially we could pay somebody, we could get somebody paid in real time, just like cash equivalent stable coin for their data. But then that's, they're just getting paid for what their data is worth today versus what their data is worth when it's pooled when with 10,000 other users' data. And so that's really the, the difference there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's, I love these questions. They're a lot of fun. Um, I'll leave my email in the chat and feel free to follow up. Um, I will uh, look out for, um, yeah, any data scientists, especially if you want to be an early Vana user and give some feedback on the interf interface we're using um, to allow researchers to query data, um, would, would love to hear from you. Amazing. Anna, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. This has been so much fun. I've learned so much. Um, this is yeah, definitely one of the best sessions we've had. So we'd love everyone to just go check out uh, Vana.xyz, um, you know, maybe hop into the Discord, join the waiting list. But yeah, just get involved. And if you're a data scientist, definitely email Anna. Awesome. Thanks so much. Cool. Thanks again. Bye-bye.